recently. All right, let's talk U.S. politics. Rena Nainen is a friend, colleague, uh, and she's a, a well-known journalist in America. She's been on uh, ABC, CBS, Fox News, almost as many platforms as I've worked on, Rena. You're making me sound so old, like I've been around too long. Well, you you, you went very quickly from one to another. No, I, you don't want to say that either, right? You better, get, better be careful. <laughs> so th this week, let's talk about you know, Trump has yeah. announced he's coming back. And I was astounded by the New York Post running this announcement at the bottom of the front page. And it says, Florida man makes announcement was the headline running across the bottom of the page in Wednesday's edition, directing readers to an article on page 26. 26? What is that all about? Wow. I think it's about much of America and many Republicans are over Trump. His own daughter, I think, is over his his you know political run. Ivanka Trump coming out saying she loves uh, and will continue to support her dad, but she's not going to be active on this campaign. And I think that says everything. It says everything. And I think the repudiation from Republicans, you know, what the 2022 American elections were really about is a check mark for American sanity. I think that's ultimately what it comes down to is it was determined that people want free, fair, judicious, honest elections, and they weren't willing to back these election deniers. I mean, some of them did, did get a couple of seats, but overwhelmingly, that was the resounding walk away from 2022 is people don't want that, and Republicans don't want that. And typically, when there is a president who's running in their first term, first midterms, it's usually about that president and about its policies. But in this case, it was about Biden, who actually has very low approval ratings, and also about Trump. And that's what we saw. Well, if you're right, and I have no reason to think that you wouldn't be, of course, is that would be a huge breath of, of fresh air. But, he, you know, there was a great post on Twitter. Florida man claims he only drinks at stoplights while not driving. Florida man sent back to prison after not paying for taxi ride home from prison. Florida man arrested for tossing Gator into Wendy's. <laughs> Some, <laughs> someday Trump will be the king of Florida men. But and you know, so that's where this Florida man came thing th thing com comes from. But it's it's more important than that. I mean, the New York Post is owned by Rupert Murdoch, right? So yeah. the, uh, it's by no accident the placement of that story on page 26. And it tells you what about Murdoch, who owns, among other things, Fox News, and what does, it, it sounds like, you know, they've the, the marriage is broken. Well, you know, this was also a marriage that he didn't want to really enter into. If you remember back when Trump had sort of, I, I believe it was Ivanka Trump had kind of reached out uh, back channeling to Rupert. And he, I don't think he really took Trump seriously. Nobody took Trump seriously until he really got the traction. Um, I don't know if Trump even, honestly, if you were to ask him, if he really took himself seriously, that he would make it as far as he did. Uh, and so in the beginning, Rupert really did not think that he had a chance and that this was really viable or somebody to support. And then the traction started building. Um, you know, we can discuss why he got the traction and how, but at this point, I think when that headline came out about Florida man, as Trump announced, remember, they saw the election results. They saw what came down and they read the room. And a lot of people found that incredibly funny. <laughs> the, the room where he made his speech, I think people were yawning, right? And nobody seemed more <laughs> bored of, of the announcement than Trump himself. I mean, is his heart in this, do you think? Or is he doing it for what reason? You know, a lot of people advised him, from what I've heard, not to announce when he did, that it just wasn't the right moment or the right time. And, you know, Trump listens to Trump. And he felt he made this announcement. He was going to make this uh, big reveal that everyone knew it was going to be him announcing his his candidacy. It'll be interesting to see what happens um, more and more. You know, I'm really, I think everyone is watching Governor DeSantis and he did incredibly well, not just winning the governorship, but by a significant lead um, and more so than he did in his last election. I think that's very telling. And also keep in mind, they had a massive hurricane down in South Florida mm -hmm. recently. And in general, 
uh, governors of Florida, whether Republican or Democrat, tend to do really well and see a bounce that preceding election, no matter how the hurricane is handled, because it gives them a lot of airtime. They're doing live press conferences. They're talking about the aid they're getting. Uh, they're talking about how they're dealing with Washington. And I can't help. I, I had think no, that, also that is plays such into an interesting perspective. I had no idea yeah. they're rubbing their hands together when they see a hurricane coming. You know, that's what happens. You know, that's how people sort of tend to translate it. And um, you end up getting funds, emergency funds, and uh, they are seen in a more compassionate, compassionate way and as, as being action oriented. So typically, they do enjoy a bounce after after a hurricane. And Trump and DeSantis seem to hate each other. They, they absolutely. I mean, I think DeSantis is, has known to not be so isolating, but Trump has made it very clear where he stands on DeSantis. Did you watch some of the interviews with Mike Pence, the former vice president, talking about maybe he's going to run, maybe he's not going to run, but he's he was pointedly asked about Trump and he said, I think we can do better. Yeah. I, and and I think that's what you're seeing within the Republican Party. Um, it was for so long establishment Republican and then MAGA supporters. And I think that influence of MAGA supporters is waning. And where does that go? And to see someone like Pence, especially after the election, it was pretty smart for him to do an interview on CNN, like that type of, of town hall one-on-one -on -one format where you see him like this. And and after he saw those election results, um, I'm not surprised that he chose to isolate himself. So you're saying part of the vote in the midterms was a rejection of Trump's politics and that, the, you know, the the nasty vitriolic America and, and the divided America that, that he created. I know I'm putting words in your mouth here, but that's <laughs> that's really my take on it. But but and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But what what else was at play in the midterms as well? I mean, there was, a, you know, abortion, women's rights. Um, there, there was a lot going on there. Just I mean, Trump was kind of in the caboose of the train, wasn't he? I think we're still piecing together what 2022 means and, and the different data points. But the big overarching thing, a lot of times my struggle with Washington journalism, and I, I covered the Obama administration for ABC and spent a lot of time in Washington covering uh, the George W. Bush administration for Fox News. Uh, and I have to tell you, a lot of times Washington reporters get caught up in these insider stories that are just not relevant or just don't relate to the, the Midwest or the South or other parts of America. And the January 6th commission, a lot of focus was on that. One, because it just was so incredible what had happened. Uh, a lot of these journalists faced the, the threats. They were on Capitol Hill. They know what it was like. But did that story resonate beyond Washington? Did people really understand the magnitude? And I think this election helped to prove that, that, that some people kind of understood what was at stake. But I think you can't dismiss abortion and what had happened. Um, you know, the, the demographic that I find most interesting and the data points that I'm trying to unearth um, is Generation Z, because they typically, um, when you look at polling and you look at sort of... Um, voters who are likely to turn out. They make up about 10%. But overwhelmingly, they came out. And 86% of Generation Z polled said that abortion was a big concern for them and that they did believe in abortion rights as well. So, And also for women, you know, it's hard, even Republican women, it's hard to be able to say, yes, this was the deciding issue. This is what, what absolutely brought people in. But there's no question, I think, January 6th and um, the restriction of abortion access had an impact on voters. So you to tie that up for me on January the 6th, you do believe then that um, while a lot of people maybe didn't sit there and watch all those hearings, although, uh, I mean, I think they were pretty uh, amazing how they were put together and how they were choreographed. And um, it was pretty disturbing to watch some of the detail that we all thought we knew and actually to see it all put together, I think, was was a huge um was it a wake up call? I mean, it it was certainly, uh, you know, made, made you understand how close democracy came to completely being crashed on the rocks in America. But you you think that that did play into the election or that people in the end, it wasn't the, the, the main issues when they went out to vote? I think the issues always matter. I think the economy, no question about it, is, sure. is front and center. Um, yeah. it's, it was one of the top issues. Uh, and then also security. Um, that was another issue. But there's no question the way the January 6th uh, situation was presented, the follow-up from Capitol Hill, Liz Cheney um, 
Congresswoman Liz Cheney, uh, having her come forward and and just so strongly stand out against Trump and against what had happened. And remember, you know, people who know the Cheneys will tell you they find Liz Cheney more conservative than her father on certain issues like abortion. She she doesn't believe in a woman's right to choose. Um, not that Dick Cheney necessarily does, but I think that on a lot of more issues, she's conservative. But on this, the issue of democracy, she was really tough and stood very tall in, in standing up against Trump and, and MAGA supporters on this and, and really wanted to unearth the truth and did. So I want to think that, you know, this nice thought that the midterms take us back to some kind of normalcy of politics in America and people just went out and vote and the, the results in the end brought us the winners, however slim some of those results were, and some of them are really thin, right? Mm -hmm. But the Democratic Governor Whitmore, um, mm -hmm. she's she's in Michigan, right? She's yes. a, a, an, um, she ran against an election denier and she was a potential victim of ex extremism, right? I mean, there was a plot to kill her. There was um, an assassination plot. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And I got to so, tell you, it's so, so funny. Yeah. So she ahead. came, she's come out now and said the biggest threat of terrorism is coming from inside the United States. Um, and that it's, a, you know, quote unquote, a scary prospect, what may still happen. So this didn't go away with the midterm. And also, you got to keep in mind, yes, she she faced this attempted assassination attempt that was really intricate and, and unbelievable. But she also took very decisive action against Roe v. Wade. And I think that won her point, something like uh, 29 points ahead by Generation Z, who chose to come out and vote for her. You know, interesting, Megan Whitmer is also very active. Um, her and Fetterman, who both of these two, Fetterman um, out in Pennsylvania, who beat um, Dr. Oz, both of them are very active on Twitter and TikTok. And I think that they're enjoying a bounce from Generation Z from that as well. But they really use those two platforms to reach that audience as well. But I, I think she's she is one person, Dana, I would say. There's a lot of questions. I don't know if you want to get into this of whether or not Biden and Kamala Harris should run as the ticket for 2024. I'm you know, happy to get be, into it. I mean, is Bi yeah. Biden's getting pretty, pretty yeah. tired looking. And um, it's interesting, though, you look at it and he was still able to galvanize and mobilize voters to come out early and on Election Day and a younger with, with the help of President Obama, ex-President oh, Obama. right? Obama was hugely influential. I think you can't discredit that. He went to some of these hugely competitive races where we didn't really know what would happen. And and, and there's no question his influence um did have an impact there. But Gretchen Whitmer is one woman to watch in American politics. I am curious if she will throw her hat in the ring. Uh, if Biden chooses to remain, does Kamala Harris stay on that ticket? Do they find somebody else? Um, if Biden it, stays yeah. the, in, in the U.S. system, there's no contest, right? He's not challenged, is he? He can be challenged. Can I mean, be. somebody can, you know, um, but in modern history it really hasn't happened. Um, and it's also messy because do you want, you really want a party united saying this is our candidate. It's not really great messaging saying, yeah, and divided. then the people who felt left divided, behind, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, the last thing I just want to touch on with you and I appreciate your time is that yeah. how does this now play out between the house being controlled by the Republicans the Senate looks like, you know, I understand there's a runoff in Georgia, but it looks like the, yeah. the Senate, even with the tiebreaker by the vice president, right, is under the, the control of the Democrats. How, right. how does that play out? Is that a political meltdown or is that some recipe for reconciliation between the two parties in a way because they can't get anything done without each other? The R word reconciliation, I don't think ever really pops up anymore in Washington. <laughs> They're so far apart. Um, but it'll be interesting because uh, when you look at kind of Obama's record and, and what he was able to achieve, you know, there was a lot of um, uh, there were a lot of policy issues. And if you look at, you know, I'm just looking at kind of at, at Biden's record, he was able to get the COVID stimulus bill passed. There were inflation. When you look at Biden's record, he was really able to get a lot of these issues passed, the COVID stimulus bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and the um, industrial policy stuff that was able to be pushed through. So there are substantive policies that he has managed in two years to get through that sometimes I don't think gets pushed out into the public as well. But um, ultimately, it will come down to whether he decides to run. And I, 
Republicans still have a little bit of a majority uh, in the House, but I think they're going to have to work together on some of the issues. And and the Senate is is still Democratic, so we'll have to see what happens. One of the big misses, I think, for Democrats in, in this past two years of having the majority in, in the House and the Senate, when you talk about safeguarding democracy, which was one of the biggest concerns going into 2022, there wasn't a lot of action taken. You know, I, I can't really point to much of anything that Democrats were able to enact and push forward that, that really could have um, if these election deniers had won, how do you stop that? How do you prevent that from happening? So it'll be interesting to see what Democrats do. They still wield a lot of power. Um, but also keep in mind, in about six, seven, eight months, we're already gearing up towards 2024. And then that race, a, a lot of, um, it's just harder to get a lot of legislation through. So we'll have to see what happens. And then the economy, JP Morgan came out today saying that that they believe it'll be a mild recession at the back end of 2023. I, I got to say, Dana, you, you follow the economy closely. You and I talk about this often. I, who knows? But like, we just have no clue what's going to happen in the next 12 months. But over yeah. and over Mixing again, the Ukraine election. war, yes. in inflation. I mean, here in the UK, they're saying that the economy is flatlining. That That's mm -hmm. not a good way to describe mm -hmm. your economy. Right? No, but no. I mean, it, they, everybody relies on the US economy and to, to stimulate the world as well. That's right. No, it's it's a big thing. And also for American voters, their pocketbooks are probably definitely number one issue for everyone. And, and everyone, I, I do get the sense, you know, higher energy costs, Europe facing much higher than in the US. Mm -hmm. I think everybody wants to make sure that the American economy is on track and, and we're doing the right things. Let's end where we began. What, what is Rena's prediction for, for Donald Trump? Man is absolutely unpredictable. But based on momentum, I just... I, I just see this puttering out. I really, even if he goes, I just don't see that he has the base he once had and enjoyed in, in back when he first ran. And I think um, Republicans are are trying to figure out how to get the next round right. And um, how, how there's, quickly, there's... by the way, does that happen? Like, I mean, does that that has to happen soon? Does it because they've got a they got to sort that out in the next year, or how quickly? That's a does great that question. That's a great question. I don't. I really don't know exactly how much time both parties really have you know i guess it depends um, on whether there's challengers how many of them yeah. are and then how that plays out right yeah and i think about you know going way back my first american politics memory back in 1992 with bill clinton running against george h w bush you know governor of arkansas kind of coming out as the dark horse you know a lot of times in in our memory uh a lot of these candidates come out as dark horses and end up winning i think in america people love a good, so we'll have to see who gets fielded in both parties. It'll be interesting for sure. Rena Nine, and great to talk to you. Uh, great to interview you and have you on the podcast. Backstory. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, Dana. You've got some great guests coming on every week. I enjoy listening. Thank you, Rena.